Do you want to quit your day job and let the money from your investments fund your dream lifestyle? We bought our first short-term rental 553 days ago, and now we've both retired from our day jobs and live off of the income from our short-term rental. And in today's video, we're going to share how you can retire early from your day job by investing in short-term rentals too. So many people have dreams of retiring from their day job and real estate is a proven path to achieving financial freedom. And more specifically, we believe that short-term rentals are one of the best, most accessible ways for the average person to achieve financial freedom and retire from their job. But for many, the idea of quitting their jobs to invest in real estate full-time just seems impossible. So in today's video, we're going to break down the exact steps you need to take to achieve financial freedom for yourself. Now, before we dive in, Let's start by defining what exactly we mean when we say retire. Now, we're not talking about Scrooge McDuck swimming in gold kind of money or private jets and Michelin star restaurants for every meal kind of money. I wish. Right? Eventually. <laughs> what we're talking about is having the option to walk away from your current day job and still having enough money to from your investments to cover and maintain your current lifestyle. And we know that it's 100% possible to retire from your day job by investing in short-term rentals because we literally just did it. Now, now, a little over a year ago, we both went full time in our business and now the money we generate covers all of our living expenses. So in this video, we're going to share the exact steps you can take to hopefully comfortably walk away from your day job and retire early too. So now that we've defined what it means to retire, we also want to talk about financial freedom and what that actually means. Now, we believe that there are different levels of financial freedom, and it's not that one day you wake up and you're financially free, yeah. but that you move along kind of a spectrum over time. Unless you win the lottery or something, then you instantly achieve financial freedom and the rest of this video becomes pretty useless. <laughs> but for the vast majority of the people who want to retire early and achieve financial freedom, we believe that there are five levels of financial freedom. So let's break down what those levels are. So and we'll go into each one of these in detail, but level one is financial disparity. Level two is financial dependence. Level three is financial independence. Level four is financial abundance. And then level five is financial legacy. Which one are we? We'll share that in just a second. <laughs> All right, so let's quickly define what each level is and what it feels like to be there. So level one is financial disparity. This is when life's a constant struggle. You're living paycheck to paycheck, or maybe your paycheck isn't even enough to last you until the next paycheck. Maybe you're worried about how you're gonna pay your bills or put food on the table. Your bank account is constantly overdrawn and there's just this kind of constant uh, financial pressure and anxiety that you have to live with. And, you know, just kind of a, a stress over how you provide for your basic living needs. So this level is obviously the worst and no one should have to live their entire life like this. But believe me, we've both been there individually and as a couple. Yeah, now when we were in college, there were times when Sarah would literally have to like, yeah. you know, like Venmo me money or whatever Venmo was at the time, just so I'd have enough money to put gas in my car to get to school, right? Like in my early 20s, my bank account was overdrawn more times than I could count. But the good news is you don't have to feel stuck at this level forever. Find a side hustle, develop some new skills, and try and find a way of making money that can help you move into the next level. I know it's it's easier said than done, but if you develop the right skills and you work like crazy, I truly do believe you can put yourself in a better financial decision. But the fact that you're here, right? You're watching our channel. Um, you're, you're doing good. <laughs> yeah, you're on the right path. Now it's just a matter of taking action. So watch more YouTube channels, read more books, start working on yourself so that your value in the marketplace continues to increase. So that's level one, financial disparity, hopefully the level that you never have to experience or that you are there, you've got a quick path to, uh, to getting out. Level two is financial dependence. So this is the level where the vast majority of people operate. Uh, you work a day job and that job provides enough income so that you're able to live a normal life. Uh, you get all of your bills paid, you've got a roof over your head, and maybe you've got like a little bit of cash saved up, right? For rainy days, vacations, whatever it is. And this level is called financial dependence because even though you're not financially struggling, you're still very much dependent on your employer to continue to provide you with that paycheck. Now, there is a, a wide range of life styles in this level. You know, you've got the school teacher who makes $50,000 a year in this range, but so is the senior level executive who makes $250,000 a year. 
Um, and that's because both of those people's income are still tied to the time that they put into a job. And that's the downside to this level, is that it requires direct exchange of time for money. Yeah, you've got to get up and go to work every day, otherwise the money stops. Which means that at this level, you lack freedom of time and freedom of choice. Now, this is where I was when I was working my W-2. I had you know, a pretty healthy six-figure income, and we had more than enough sure money was. to cover our expenses <laughs> and take, take vacations and build our savings. Like, we, we were comfortable, right? Yeah. We were like solidly living a, a fun middle-class life here in California. But but I had very little freedom of time and choice. Yeah. Uh, I would sit down at my computer at, you know, oftentimes at seven o'clock in the morning and I'd be there until dinner time. Uh, I traveled regularly and I was literally on call 24 seven. I could get yeah. calls at six o'clock in the morning. I could get calls at eight o'clock at night. Um, Later than that, they were calling me all the time. All the time, right? And we even had unlimited PTO, but I was so nervous every time I put in a request <laughs> yeah. and felt like I was literally doing something wrong yeah. by asking for time off. So how do you get out of level two? Well, that's what the rest of the video is about, but let's go over the last two levels first. So level three of financial freedom is financial independence. So financial independence. It's similar to level two in the sense that all of your basic living expenses are covered, but the key difference is that it's your investments, it's your business that it's providing the income and not a job. So this is where we are right now, right? Yep, we're, yeah. we're, uh, we're smack dab in, in level three. You know? Not bad, right? Not bad. Not bad. Right? <laughs> Not bad, not bad. The money we get from our YouTube channel, from our podcast, from our events, and our short-term rentals, that covers all of our basic living expenses. And to be honest, the majority of that comes from our short-term rentals. So we definitely don't live like a crazy, lavish no, life, I right? Wish. Like we drive a, a Nissan Pathfinder, you know? We don't have a mansion, but we live in a, a nice house in yeah. a neighborhood that we love. You know, like I said, we don't drive a Bentley or anything, but we have decent cars to get us from point A to point B. We don't shop at like, you know, I still shop at like Forever 21, yeah. you know? <laughs> We're gonna go shopping! But the biggest thing is that we have freedom and that's freedom of time and Amen. freedom of choice. And I think that's what's most important to me. Amen. <laughs> we have freedom of time in the sense that we don't have to be locked in an office from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. We don't have to put in any requests for paid time off anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately we have freedom of choice because we get to choose what work we do ourselves and what work we outsource. I have the freedom of choosing, of deciding what my business looks like and what projects we actually work on, right? And we have freedom of choice in who we work with, right? Like not often as an employee, do you get to choose who your coworkers are? That's but true. luckily as an owner, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, we're never forced to work with someone that we don't like. To us, this is where life really starts. We wake up every day so incredibly grateful for the life that we're living. We like literally so can't believe that this is our life. This is the life of Bobo I like actually get emotional like thinking about <laughs> how happy I am with the life that we're living. Yeah, it's just so different from the what was that level? Financial, Financial dependence. Such a different life. We were making more money, right? Like mm -hmm. I was, you know, spending at that time, but the stress level isn't there anymore. The quality time is there again. It's just I think the things that are really important in life are now in this category of financial independence. independence. Yeah, I'm learning with you guys. <laughs> now, if you're watching this video, this level is probably the one that you should be focusing on getting to first. It's about generating enough income from your own entrepreneurial work to cover all of your living expenses. And specifically in this video, we're gonna talk about how to do that with short-term rentals. But what's crazy is that there are still two more levels after this one. Ah. And that brings us to level four, which is financial abundance. So think of it this way. If level three is about your investments, your, your business, covering your basic living expenses, then reaching level four is where your investments can fund your dream life. And this is the level that we're working towards currently, no! right? Like that's the, the goal. This is the level where you stop really checking price tags and money doesn't factor into any of your day-to-day -day decision making, right? Like if you wanna, whatever you wanna do, right? Like you don't really have to think about the financial consequences of doing that. You wanna fly first class around Europe? No problem. You wanna charter your own private plane around Europe instead? Like, yeah, sure, do that. You want a 10,000 square foot mansion overlooking the water or, you know, whatever. Maybe it's buying a house for your parents and paying off their mortgage. Like whatever it is, you got the financial means to do it. But that's what this level is about. It's about taking whatever your dream life is and making it a reality. Well, literally sounds amazing, but we know that few people make it to this level, but we know that it's not impossible. Yeah. I feel like we personally know people that are at this level. Yeah, we've met other investors who are here. 
And I yeah. think we're determined to get there ourselves. We're chugging away. We'll get there. <laughs> yeah. And you guys are lucky enough because you get to see the journey all along. And right? we're teaching you guys and you guys will be there. We're like all trucking together. But there's one more level and that's level five. Level five is financial legacy. And this is when your investments not only fund your dream life, but also your kids' dream lives and your grandkids' dream lives and their what? kids' dream lives. That far? That far. Whoa. Right? Whoa. But this is essentially when the wealth you've accumulated is big enough to last generations. And this is the ultimate goal for many people and definitely a goal for us, Heck right? Yeah. Like, you know, I want the last name Robinson to, to mean something, you know, even long after I'm gone. So I'm hopeful, yes I am. Hopeful for today, take this but yeah, so now that we've covered all five levels of financial freedom, let's clarify that this video again will be about reaching level three, which is financial independence, right? It's about creating enough income from your business and investments that you don't have to get up every day and go to a J-O-B. So we've come up with four steps to retire early by investing in short-term rentals. So let's dive in. Okay, so step number one is to determine your baseline. So let's break down exactly what we mean by that. Now, your baseline is the dollar amount you'll need to cover your, your current lifestyle, right? So that's your mortgage, car payments, insurance, groceries, savings, and pretty much everything else you need to live the life that you're currently living. So that number is going to vary person by person, obviously. So take a little bit of time and figure out what that number is for you. And once you have your baseline identified, you'll do some math to figure out how many short-term rentals you'll need to purchase to cover your baseline. So let's look at an example. All right, let's say your baseline is $6,000 per month. So you need $6,000 per month to fund your current lifestyle. And let's say on average that you can cash flow about two grand per month from a short-term rental, which I think is very reasonable. At $2,000 per month in cash flow, you'll need three properties to reach your baseline of $6,000. Now, again, I chose $6,000 as a baseline, like super Random, arbitrarily, yeah. right? But the $2,000 per month in cash flow is definitely possible with short-term rentals. And many of our listings routinely beat that number. So I think it's a decent rule of thumb to, to use. And just for, you know, context, what size property are you talking about? I mean, I don't even think it matters right like it's going to vary market to market like we have small properties that are doing more than that we have bigger properties that are doing more than that but on average i think it's it's fair to say that somewhere around that's safe bucks to is, say yeah. yeah okay so now that you've completed step one and you know what your baseline is and you have a general idea of how many short-term rentals you need to purchase you're ready for step number two now before we move on to step two i would really appreciate if you could give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel and hit the bell for notifications uh, we're a little over a year into this journey uh and but we're so extremely appreciative and grateful for everyone that subscribed to our channel. We still don't feel like YouTubers, but there's a lot of you out there who think that we are, so we appreciate <laughs> that. Also, uh, if you want to connect with us on Instagram, I'm at Tony J. Robinson. My wife is at Sarah Rad. We uh, try and do our best uh, to respond to folks there. If you want a free, totally free download on how to analyze short-term rentals, which goes great with this video, uh, head over to alphageekcapital.com forward slash calculator. You can pick that up for free there. Follow us on TikTok at The Real Estate Robinson. And last, uh, if you want to become a short-term rental host, which again, hopefully after this video you do, uh, hit the link in our bio. We have a referral code for Airbnb, or if you sign up using that code, you get a cash bonus for signing up, and then we get a cash bonus for referring you, so we definitely appreciate that as well. All right, so now that you've determined your baseline and you have a clear goal for how many units you need to purchase, it's time for step two, which is figuring out your purchasing power. And your purchasing power is made up of two things. The first is the loan amount that you can get approved for. And the second is how much capital you have to invest. Those things are related, but slightly different. So let's talk about your loan approval amount first. Take a moment and assess your personal financial situation, specifically around your debt to income ratio or DTI for short. And if you look at all of your monthly debt payments, things like your car loan, your student loans, credit card payments, et cetera, and you compare that to your income, how much money is left over at the end of each month? Do your debt payments make up 20% of your income, 50% of your income, 80% of your income? Uh, for most lenders, they're gonna wanna see your current debt to income ratio, um, somewhere around like the 40% range, maybe 50% range, depending on which lender. Um, but this is what a lender is going to look at to determine whether or not you can actually get approved for a loan. Lenders want to see a low DTI because that means you'll be able to afford this new mortgage payment. Now, if your DTI is low, then you're in good shape, right? Uh, if your DTI is a little bit higher, then it's going to limit your ability to personally finance uh, the short-term rental. Now, the other aspect of your loan approval amount is your personal credit history. Now, what does your credit score currently look like? Are you in the 500s, in the 800s, somewhere in between? Again, the better your score, the easier chances you'll have of getting approved and the better terms you'll get if you are approved. 
right? The lower the score, the harder it'll be for you. Now, let me be clear. Even if you have a high debt to income ratio or a lower credit score, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't move forward, but it does mean that you need to find a way around those two obstacles. And luckily for you, there are different ways to do that. That's cool that there's ways to do that. There's always a way. <laughs> Where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> Now you can look for lenders that lend based on the asset and not so much the borrower. You can look for a partner that has a credit score or the DTI needed to get approved. Or you can, you know, do take a little bit of time, right? But you can improve your own financial balance sheet by working on bringing down your debt to income ratio or improving your credit score, which honestly aren't bad things if you want to become investors anyway. You yeah, probably want to have those to two have things anyways, in check yeah. regardless. But either way, it's important for you to understand what loan amount you might get approved for. Because unless you've got enough money laying around to pay cash for a property, which most people don't, you're going to need to get some kind of mortgage or a loan on the property to purchase it. Now, the second step of your purchasing power is being real with yourself about how much liquid cash you have available to invest. Because even if you can get approved for the loan, you're still going to need capital to purchase and furnish your property. So let's review exactly how much capital you might need for a short-term rental purchase. On average, you can expect to pay anywhere between 10 and 20% of the purchase price as a down payment. And you can expect another two to 3% in closing costs. And you're not done spending money once you buy the property because you still have to furnish it and fill it with all of the other supplies and essentials that are needed to run a short-term rental. We call this your startup costs. Now the startup costs are gonna vary pretty wildly depending on what market you're in, the size of your property, whether you're going for luxury rental versus economic rental, you know, or being somewhere in between. So you could spend as little as $10,000 in startup costs, or you could spend $100,000 in startup costs. I think a lot of that's going to depend on you and your unique situation, but either way, you're going to need money to make that happen. Yeah. But just like your ability to get a loan, if you don't have the cash reserves to spend 50 or 100K to cover your down payment and your startup costs, um, or whatever number is needed for your market, then you'll need to either A, save up the funds that you need, or B, find a partner that can bring the funds for you. So those are the two components that make up your purchasing power. And if you want to learn more about how to finance your short-term rental with only 10% down, then check out the video that we linked in the description where we interviewed one of our lenders, um, Brenna. Now, a quick notes before we move on to step three. If you end up bringing in a partner, then you'll need to adjust your baseline and property goals accordingly. Now, going back to our original example, where your baseline is $6,000 per month, and you get $2,000 per month in cash flow per property for short-term rental, your original target number of properties was three, right? Because 2,000 right. three times the $6,000 per month. But let's say you bring in a partner and it's 50-50 on each deal. Uh, so they get 50% of the capital or the cash flow, you get the other 50%. So instead of $2,000 per month in cash flow, you now you're getting 1,000, which means your target number of properties needs to go from three to six. Now, we also have a video where we break down the exact partnership structures we've used to scale our business. So there's also a link to that video in the description as well. So now that you've figured out your funding, it's time for step three, which is taking your listing live. This is where all of the fun stuff really starts, in my opinion. And by fun, <laughs> I think what she means is hard work because some days it, it's really hard. Like if yeah, you saw sure. our car right now, it's actually filled uh, with a bunch of little like yeah. chingaderas that we need for this house. So. Yeah, fun, like it is fun, but I can also cry, so. Okay. <laughs> but this is the step where you actually purchase your property, get it set up, start accepting guests, and more importantly, start making some money. That's the fun part. <laughs> <laughs> now we've got several videos to go over the nitty gritty parts of setting up your property and we'll link to those in the description as well, but we'll kind of highlight the big pieces here. First, you want to analyze the property you're considering purchasing to ensure that it's a good cash flowing property. And once you've done that and you're, you're fairly confident that you'll get a solid return, then it's time to actually like buy the property, right? Here's where you submit your offer, negotiate with the seller and get the keys to your very first short term rental. So once you own the property, it's time to get it ready for guests. And that includes designing the property to make it beautiful and a place that guests really want to book. It also means setting up your property with the right products to make your job as the host a little bit easier. And of course, you'll also have to assemble your team that will help you manage the operations of the property. But again, we won't spend too much time here with that because literally every other video on this channel will help you with this step. Yeah. But that's step number three, taking your listing live. 
So on to step number four, and that is saving your cash flow and repeating the process. Yes, you heard us correctly. We want you to save the vast majority of the cash flow that you're making from your short-term rental. And here's why. Now, ideally, if you can, you should save 100% of your cash flow. But if you want to spend a little, my recommendation is that you save at least 95% of your cash flow and then spend the other 5%. Um, I totally understand, right, that you want to enjoy the, the fruits of your labor a little bit, but if you spend the majority or all of the cash flow from your first short-term rental, then building the cash that's needed for the next one will prove to be a challenge. For us in our business, we didn't touch any of the cash flow until we were like almost 18 months in, I think. Heck yeah. I was very confused. <laughs> what? <laughs> we were saying, he was saying that it, the properties were doing so well. And I was like, how, where, why, why is our account not reflecting? <laughs> but yeah, that's why, that's why. So let's look at this with some, some real actual numbers. Let's say that your total cash investment on your first short-term rental was $60,000. And that includes your down payment, your closing costs, and your furnishings, right? All of your startup costs. And that short-term rental will again give you $2,000 per month in cash flow or $24,000 per year in cash flow. So if you did nothing but save your $2,000 per month, you'd have another $60,000 saved up every 30 months in 30 months, right? And then that gives you an additional $2,000 per month in cash flow, bringing your total to $4,000 per month. Now at $4,000 per month, you'll have your next $60,000 saved up in 15 months. And after those 15 months, you'll be at three properties and $6,000 per month in cash flow. So let me recap that for my folks that aren't numbers people. You lost me. You buy property <laughs> number one, you buy property number one, and then 30 months later, you get property number two, and then 15 months later, you get property number three. So within 45 months of buying your first short-term rental, you can be in a position to achieve level three financial independence and retire from your job. I know that I've simplified that process a bit, right? And maybe my wife doesn't- uh, Almost stuck on stupid over here, but I get it. <laughs> Right, because I know, right? There, there are a lot of small things that go into these four steps, but this is honestly the, the exact same framework that we use to achieve level three financial independence and retire from our own jobs. So if you follow this game plan and watch the other videos that we've linked to in the description, you know, I'm fairly confident that if you take the action, you can do the same thing as well. If you guys have any follow-up questions, please drop a comment below and we'll do our best to answer it, or Tony will. And that's it for today, guys. I'm Sarah. I'm Tony. And we are the Real, Real Estate, Estate Robinsons. Robinsons.